9 o'clock sharp, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for Using Coriolis Meters for Custody Transfer, presented, presented by Siemens Eric Heilheil. Eric's going to talk about improvements in Coriolis mass flow meters that make them a viable solution for custody transfer applications. In this session, he's going to answer things like what is custody transfer, when is it used, how does Coriolis work to measure flow, where is Coriolis technology used in custody transfer, and what makes the Siemens Coriolis mass flow a good choice. Eric is Siemens flow product manager responsible for Coriolis magnetic and flow product lines. He brings more than 20 years experience in flow measurement, variety of process instrument companies as account manager, product manager, and engineer. Eric's been with Siemens since 2005. He has a bachelor's degree from Temple University and a master's from Drexel University. We will be meeting the phone lines if you have any questions and would like to ask a question. There is a tool built into go to webinar, just type in your question and I'll make sure that it gets answered. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Eric. Well, good morning everybody and I hope all can hear me well and clear and I want to again thank you for taking the time out of your schedules to, uh, to hear us talk about Coriolis and custody transfer. One thing I would like to add is that if you do have a question, don't wait till the end of the presentation. Please uh, send your questions through as soon as you think of them and I will uh, stop the presentation and answer it. I think it's more important to answer the questions as they come up rather than uh, wait till the end so that we can all forget uh, what I was talking about. So it's important. Ask them. I'll be more than happy to address them. So without further ado, let's talk a little about Coriolis. First point I always like to mention is to spend a very little bit about little time on how a Coriolis meter works. <sighs> Coriolis meter works by actually weighing the mass, much like a regular scale that you would find in your house. So it is an actual mass measurement. It measures the pounds and the kilograms, as opposed to a volumetric measurement, which measures a fixed space and the amount of mass in that space. The way a Coriolis meter works, though, is kind of interesting. What you have here, and you see a picture, is that you have a set of tubes. Now, there are two tubes in here. Uh, they're just uh, one right in front of the other. And they vibrate away and together in, uh, from each other. And they do that by means of the driver, which is down here at the bottom. And the driver, pardon me, the driver drives the tube to the tube's resonant frequency, which is that frequency that the tube has when it is at its happiest, when it takes the least amount of energy to oscillate the tube. It's a resonant frequency. Now, what we also have on the tube are these two pickoffs. Pickoff, what we call pickup one and pickup two. And what they are is they are nothing more than a, uh, a coil of wire moving in and out of a magnet. Now, when you move a coil of wire in and out of a magnet, it induces a voltage in the coil of wire. Now, when these tubes are vibrating in, uh, back and forth and the coils and the magnets are moving in and out, they generate a sinusoidal curve, a sine wave curve of AC uh, voltage. Okay, so it goes up and goes down. Now, as far as Coriolis goes, there's no Coriolis feature here at all at this point. But what's interesting is that as you introduce flow, moving through the tube, what ends up happening is the inlet leg of the tube slows down because things at rest tend to stay at rest and the fluid moving into the tube is not vibrating whereas the tube is. So the inlet side of the tube has a tendency to slow down due to the liquid pushing on the tube and the tube pushing on the liquid. By the time that fluid flows through the tube to the other side where the other pickup is, that fluid has begun to accelerate with the tube because now things in motion tend to stay in motion. So the outlet leg tends to accelerate beyond its normal position. So what you'll see as these things move is you'll actually see a warping of the tube as the mass flowing through with the pounds moving through slow the inlet side down and accelerate the outlet side. 
So now, if you remember, the pickups are moving in and out. When there's no flow, they're moving in and out both one and two at the exact same rate. What ends up happening when you have flow moving in, slowing down the inlet side and accelerating the outlet side, is you have a phase differential between the right side and the left side. And that's what you can see in this picture here on the right of the picture. Uh, you see the sine curves of the pickups, and you can actually see a time difference, or delta T, between the right side and the left side. And that delta T, that change in time between the right side and the left side when flow is present, is directly proportional to the amount of pounds that are slowing and the amount of pounds that are accelerating and the amount of twist that the tube has. So much like a scale, which has a spring attached to a needle, the tube now is that spring, and the needle are the pickups. So that's the whole thing about a Coriolis meter. Things at rest stay at rest, things in motion stay in motion, and we measure the time difference from right to left when the tubes are warping. That's how it works. So what makes a Coriolis good for custody transfer is what makes a Coriolis good for pretty much any very valuable or high accuracy required application. You can get a mass flow accuracy of a 0.1% of rate on a Coriolis meter is fairly standard. You get a density accuracy of 0 0.0005 grams per cc, uh, which is it's pretty much an industry standard. You also get a, a high sensitivity uh, for very low flows. So the, the Coriolis effect, if you size the meter right, can measure incredibly low flows uh, with a very large turndown. So you can get a meter that has typically 100 to 1 turndown. You can get a Coriolis meter at 500 to 1 or 750 to 1 or even greater. So you can get a single device used for a variety of flow rates. Coriolis meters have extremely stable zero points. As long as the mounting of the meter is stable and isn't being squeezed or stretched or heated excessively, then uh, the zero usually stays very, very stable. Uh, whereas with other devices, over temperature or pressure changes, you can get drift. Uh, most of these devices, as I've just explained, has a, uh, have a very a relatively high immunity to process noise. So if there's a lot of uh, flow noise in the flow stream, or if there is a good deal of pipe stresses, um, some of the higher end Coriolis meters provide uh, extremely robust cases and, uh, pro and uh, internal uh, filters to help overcome the noise that the process will have, which is what the next, <laughs> the next message is. So this heavy-duty manifold is designed in, in this particular picture here. This, this is just a tube, but if you remember from the previous picture, you've got this huge cutaway. You've got a, almost an inch of three... 304 stainless steel on this particular design that resists compression, tension, or torsion on the flanges. So the, this type of thing really helps uh, with the heavy-duty manifold disconnect the piping noises from the meter. One of the things the Siemens has, the Siemens meter has, is what's called a hemi-shaped inlet port. Uh, so everybody says, hey, it's got a hemi in it, and it turns out in this case to be true. A hemispherical inlet port was initially designed for the biotech industry and the food and beverage industry where they can't have any dead space. It has to be a, a BPE certified, smooth, no, no dead zones where material can build up. Turns out it does a number of things. It keeps uh, delicate materials from getting uh, overcavitated. Uh, it uh, reduces dead spots so there is no buildup of materials such as paraffins and oil and gases or milk fats in milk. Okay. It evenly distributes uh, the flow between two tubes so you don't have an unbalanced flow, which is a good thing. Uh, and it also helps reduce the pressure loss by contouring the flow so that it helps uh, um, distribute the flow 
between the two meters uh, tubes. And in the, the case of the Siemens meter, the tubes are so short that we can actually have a lower pressure drop on a dual tube meter than some competitive uh, single tube meter. So that's always good. And a lot of that has to do with uh, the hemi-shape inlet port. So that's Coriolis in, in a nutshell. I'm looking to see if there are any questions, and not yet. So that's good. Anyhow, so what is custody transfer? Well, whenever ownership of a material or sale of a material takes place uh, in the United States, the device required to measure has to be certified. So even in a supermarket, you'll see a scale at the checkout counter that has to be certified by the Weights and Measures Division. In the case of fiscal meters or custody transfer meters, uh, they're used not only to sell something, but for exchanging uh, pr ownership of products uh, or overall just simply selling it like gas, gas at a gasoline pump. But they need to be certified by a governing body. Now, the United States does this in a very interesting way. At the very head of this all is the uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, in Washington. And NIST says, it sets the units and defines them. But they also have departments that set out uh, to set the standards for uh, fiscal metering. And that's all governed by the National Conference of Weights and Measures. Now the National Conference of Weights and Measures has a division called the Nash, uh, NTEP, which is National Type Evaluation Program. And these are the guys that go out and test all the meters. They test the meters, they test the scales for delivering potato chips, they test uh, the gasoline pumps to make sure that the metering in the gasoline pumps are accurate. And there are these devices, these, I'm sorry, these uh, divisions that are responsible for certifying uh, sensors, meters, scales, and what have you. So we went through an extremely uh, involved testing regime, for the Siemens meters anyway, where we tested four meters in two configurations, remote and integral, where the transmitter was either attached or detached, in two materials, stainless steel and hastaloy, for both volume, so gallons, cubic feet, cubic meters, etc., and mass, pounds and kilograms. We tested more meters for more variations uh, in a shorter time than any other manufacturer had to date. And uh, it was kind of interesting because uh, it, it pretty much took up all my time. Uh, so what did we end up doing? Well, first, firstly, we developed a uh, what they call the FCS 200, which is a compressed natural gas meter. It comes in a 3 8 half inch, and one inch size. And these are the primary sizes for dispensing compressed natural gas uh, to the general public or to industry for vehicle use. So if you're getting a compressed natural gas vehicle uh, or CN, CNV or CNGV, they call it compressed natural gas vehicle, these are the types of meters you would see in the actual gas pump. You would probably see the, the half inch unit in the middle there and the big meter you would see at the compressor station. So you get gas delivered to your filling station in a gas line at 10 PSI into a tank, you compress it, you distribute it to the entire station through the big Coriolis meter, and then the individual gas, gas pumps uh, would have the smaller Coriolis meter in it. Typically, we designed the half inch to be for trucks and buses, and the three eighths of an inch uh, to be for uh, cars, but the industry is pretty much standardized on half inch. Now for liquid, we use an entirely different meter and it covers just about all the other fluids. Now we didn't cover any other gases with this particular device yet, but for the uh, FC430, which is a liquid flow meter, uh, this is available in stainless steel or hastaloy and again can be measured, uh, you can measure in either mass or volume. Uh, there are four different sizes. There's a, a half inch, one inch, two inch, and three inch. 
and all configurations and all styles are all covered by a national type evaluation program or NTEP. So this is uh, an, a good way of getting a meter that is easy to use. Uh, it has one of the best local user interfaces available in the marketplace. Physically small. Uh, the half inch meter is only 10 inches long, only weighs about 10 pounds. Uh, so we're smaller than pretty much anybody else on the marketplace, which makes us easy to retrofit. Also makes it easier for one person to handle the installation, which is a nice cost savings. So these meters are approved for fiscal metering or custody transfer. And when I say what they're approved for, it's any liquid or solution that meets the following criteria. Basically, it has to be a liquid, normal liquid, like alcohol or glycols, mixes, or et cetera, uh, with a density of 0 0.59 to 1.1 specific gravity. So water has a specific gravity of 1, so it can be a little bit heavier than water and about half the weight, half the density of water. So we, we designed this specifically for the chemical and the uh, oil and gas marketplace, so it pretty much fits the criteria of all of those uh, fluids. The only things they don't cover are compressed gases in the liquids or cryogenics. Again, taking a look for questions. Don't see any yet, so I will continue. So this is a typical uh, screenshot of what uh, NTEP will give the vendor, such as us, such as Siemens, uh, on their meter. So they literally make it very simple. They say, here's your part number from half inch, one inch, two inch, and three inch. They tell you the size, and then they tell you the flow rates. So in pounds a minute, the smallest meter can go down to 12.6. The large, the highest end flow is uh, 4, uh, 225. In gallons, we converted that. And then, of course, the minimum measured quantity, which is abbreviated as MMQ. It's nice that they told us that. Uh, is four pounds. So the minimum ac minimum measured quantity that the meter is good for is four, and in gallons it's, it's about half a gallon. And this goes all the way up to in the three inch meter where we can flow 77,500 pounds a minute or 1,322 gallons with a minimum measured quantity of 200 uh, or 24 gallons, and that's, of course, in the three-inch meter. This is actually a screenshot directly off of the certification. So where are some of these used? Well, the food and beverage uh, is a hotbed uh, for uh, custody transfer because, for example, in milk, uh, you, you oftentimes find local dairies delivering uh, uh, their milk uh, from the farm, directly to the uh, processing facility. And so the ownership of that fluid has to be accounted for. And a Coriolis meter would work perfect for that. We'll go a little bit more into bakeries in a couple of slides. Uh, frozen concentrated orange juice uh, turns out to be a, a whole other uh, 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 industry because the way they, they collect the orange juice differs from area to area. So local, you'll have a local collective, some places just lo local farms, uh, some have different squeezing methods, and the densities are always different because of the pulp. So it's interesting that the orange juice industry has some distinct similarities, but some very distinct differences uh, from, uh, uh, from the dairy world. And then, of course, soft drink manufacturing, we'll spend a whole slide on just that. Uh, all they care about is density and sugar. Uh, sugar is, is, is money because really all they have is a can filled with water with sugar in it. So it is the sugar that is the primary driving market. Again, we'll be spending much more time on that. So here's dairies. We talked a little bit about this. Uh, you have uh, internal and external measurements where custody transfers are used uh, to get from the collectives to the facility. So the collectives have to get paid right off, so the trucks will have custody transfer meters on it, and then the trucks have to transfer ownership of their milk to the dairy, and then they use a custody transfer meter for that. Uh, on the dairy world, uh, handling a dual phase situation is important because a lot of times there's frothing. 
<coughs> we'll be spending a, a little bit of time specifically talking about dual phase where you have both a liquid and a gas mixed together and how the Coriolis meter can handle that. Uh, again, we'll, we'll have a whole slide just on that. So when using a custody transfer meter, uh, for milk anyway, it's important that it has B3A approved, that it has the right flanges, and that uh, it doesn't uh, uh, churn up the milk because that will turn uh, pure milk into cottage cheese or butter. So the hemispherical inlet port in this particular case is a really great benefit because it's nice and calming uh, and it eases the, uh, the stress on the fluid. There are a couple other products that we offer that are pretty much installed right alongside of the custody transfer Coriolis meters, uh, such as uh, magnetic flow meters. They also have custody transfer. Uh, they have clean and place loops for the magnetic flow meters. In the pasteurized tanks, pasteurization tanks, they have level meters that seam in cells, as well as um, uh, ultrasonic clamp-on meters that are offered in order to check everything, because they can just get clamped on and then move to another place. Bakeries. This was actually um, uh, a new foray for us. Uh, we hadn't realized that there were so many custody transfer uh, requirements here, but uh, oil, the oil that bakeries use uh, to spray on biscuits and crackers, uh, the delivery and receipt of that ha oftentimes has to be uh, custody transfer uh, governed. And then the application is standard Coriolis meter use because if you use too much, oil is a lot of money and uh, they don't want to use too much, but you can't use too little because it then leads to poor quality. Uh, the greasing of the pans, again, adding oil to take that out, doesn't need to be custody transfer for the application, but the delivery of the oil does. <clears throat> Some other products that Siemens offers uh, that are, again, right next door to uh, the Coriolis meters are, again, our level products for the oil tanks and then the uh, core, the uh, uh, magnetic flow meters for the clean in place loops. A lot of these loops uh, will run on a on a fairly regular cycle where they'll they'll make a batch, run a clean cycle, do a batch, run a clean cycle. It's an FDA requirement. All right, breweries, uh, near and dear to my heart personally. Uh, the key thing about breweries is that it's not just uh, custody transfer for the delivery or the dispensing of the beer into the kegs or into the cans. Uh, it's uh, also for the very exacting requirements in the manufacturing of the beer. Uh, when the water is entered into the louder ton, where the grain is and it's all cooked and the boiled all out, and to get the sugars, it's again the sugar where it's key importance here, where the Coriolis meter is used to uh, determine how much sugar is in the, uh, the mix by means of measuring the density. Because Coriolis meter not only measures the flow very accurately, it also measures the density. Because the more dense a fluid is, the uh, more mass will be in the tube at any given time. So if you're measuring something like helium, which is very, very light, and you have the tubes filled with helium, the frequency of the tubes will be higher. If you fill the tubes filled with, say, liquid mercury, the tubes will oscillate at a resonant frequency much lower. So we can tell within four decimal places what the density is of the fluid. And when you have more sugar or the right amount of sugar in your uh, wort, or, or vort, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, in the, in the, after the latter ton, then you know that your, your grain is cooked enough. So for custody transfer applications usually come at the end when they're filling or transferring ownership from the brewery into the kegs and they need to make sure that the kegs are exactly filled just right because they sell by that. So a lot of times they use that by volume. So key things that they, they do is they're looking to, to eliminate errors because temperature changes and temperature changes in volume always confuse uh, volumetric meters, have no bearing and no effect on a Coriolis meter. Okay. Looking for questions. There are no questions yet. Okay, very good. 
Other devices we use right next door, of course, temperature is critical, and they have to keep an eye on it at every stage. You don't want to burn it, and you don't want to undercook it, or you don't get the right, uh, right amount of sugar. Uh, Mag 1100Fs by Siemens, which are food-grade magnetic flow, uh, are all over the place. Uh, is even in the distribution of, uh, of uh, waters into the, uh, into the light beer category. So when they make a beer, the difference between beer and light beer is how much uh, water they add after the beer is made. So they literally are watering down the beer. That's why it's such a high profit product. Uh, level products for the fermentation and uh, the beer tanks. So they want to make sure that the levels are set. And then, of course, the malt and grain storage silos as well level. Uh, beverage plants such as uh, sodas, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, fruit drinks, high C, that kind of stuff, or any, any, any fruity beverage you find in a, in a carton or a bottle. Uh, I mentioned before that uh, either high fructose corn syrup, which is a very inexpensive way to get uh, sweetness in it, or uh, grain, uh, sorry, not grain, <laughs> or uh, uh, regular sucrose corn uh, from, from the stalks, cane sugar, uh, is all what it's about. If you can make your process sweeter with, uh, without wasting sugar, you will have a, a happy bottom line. So a lot of these companies manufacture their uh, chemicals as syrups and then on site mix them with water. So it's important to get the specific mix of sugar and water in these and it is the sugar that is delivered with custody transfer because there are different kinds, different grades and different qualities of sugar and a lot of that is dictated by the density of the solution that is being delivered in and it is there that custody transfer is used in, in beverage plants. Uh, as I said before, sugar is money to them and uh, if you've contracted to deliver sugar of a certain quality uh, they are surely going to confirm that the quality ordered is quality delivered. So other products that are, again, right next door, again, they have the, uh, cus the clean in place loops uh, to make sure everything is nice and clean, uh, make sure no bugs are growing, and then, uh, of course, there is a clamp on ultrasonic stuff for a flow validation throughout. So this in industry uh, any part of it, even the frozen concentrated orange juice guys, are all f uh, fixed on bricks. Bricks is the measure of sugar. Degrees bricks is the measure of sugar, and our, our meter has that built in. Uh, you can just select an uh, option to have that uh, turned on, and uh, that is available as an output. So wherever you can find uh, where sugar use is not optimized and can make that correction uh, in this industry, uh, you'll be a hero. Pharma and biotech. Well, the uh, custody transfer world uh, in drugs, uh, in drug manufacturing, and in biotech uh, is uh, very, very vast. Uh, there are a lot of FDA requirements that will require uh, that uh, uh, certain approved meters, uh, government approved meters, are utilized uh, in the manufacture of, of some of these uh, processes. So. Uh, that's where the custody transfer comes in. But throughout the entire process, Coriolis are used, again, because a pound is a pound, whether it's a pound of helium or, or a pound of maple syrup, uh, and whether uh, it, it doesn't matter whether you're measuring one or the other from day to day. So the biotech and the pharma guys love these things. So they use them in the fermentation facilities to feed the gases into the fermentation tanks, and then, of course, the uh, uh, post-fermentation to check the density, make sure that they got that right, uh, and chromatography columns uh, to control the transfer conditions, and interestingly enough, even to uh, measure uh, the supercritical CO2, which is used as a, um, as a uh, solvent, uh, supercritical CO2 as a zero uh, centipoise viscosity. So it easily carries, and as soon as it reaches atmospheric conditions, uh, Critical, the supercritical CO2 disappears in the environment, and uh, uh, we measure that uh, quite well. So there's a lot of water measurement to make sure that the water is purified. You can use a, a magnetic meter for high-purity DI water, deionized water. 
So you would use that, or reverse osmosis systems, you would use a Coriolis meter to confirm all that. Uh, so a lot of these applications uh, will require a Coriolis meter, but only a few require custody transfer. Across the spectrum of uh, many varying applications, you'll find uh, dosing and filling applications in the food and beverage industry, in the drug and pharma industry, biotech, uh, where they need to get the uh, footprints of the manufacturing skids as small as possible. They need to uh, optimize the process for accuracy, repeatability, and overall performance. And this is where the Coriolis meter, specifically the Siemens Coriolis meter, really does a fine job. Uh, it does, because it's so small, the data update rate is over 100 hertz. So uh, every 10 milliseconds, the data is updated. So if the flow rate is changing or the, the process line is moving very quickly, uh, the Siemens meter does a very fine job of, uh, of meeting the requirements. Now at the end here, you can see uh, enhanced GVF flow performance. That stands for gas void fraction. And we're getting very close to the dual phase discussion uh, of this presentation, I have taken note of the time, uh, and I will spend uh, at least a good few minutes on talking about what the Coriolis does when it meets uh, multi-phase flow, uh, specifically gas and liquids. In fact, I'm going to do it right now. So, when you have a Coriolis meter and you have are measuring either all gas or all liquid, that meter is as happy as it can be and you will get incredibly accurate uh, performance. The problem occurs when you start mixing phases because what ends up happening is uh, if the flow is not homogeneously distributed throughout uh, the pipes, you can get unbalanced pipes, uh, you can get um, uh, large slugs of air uh, or, or voids, large slugs of gas where you have liquids and it's very hard for the meter to, to compensate for this and to overcome. And there's a lot of uh, features built into the meter to, to try to optimize its performance under these very trying conditions for a Coriolis meter. This picture you see here is a flow pipe with uh, what looks to be like carbonated uh, fluid. Uh, anything that can keep the bubble small uh, and the velocity fast, uh, or the actually they see the overall a diameter of each bubble small and then the velocity of flow of the bubbles quick and homogeneously distributed will increase the performance of the meter, uh, any Coriolis meter, be it ours or our competitors. Uh, so what the, I'll spend a little bit more time on this, what the Siemens meter has is a, a series of built-in filters that monitors the drive current. The drive current is that center pickoff that vibrates the tube. When you start to get into a situation like you see on the screen now, where you have aerated flow, the, the driver coil really needs to vibrate the tube quite vigorously in order to try to get the pickoffs to get a reliable signal. So what ends up happening is the driver coil will require more and more uh, uh, current as the gas or the dual phase condition worsens throughout the meter. So our device monitors that and what it does is, is that it starts to set up one of three filter situations. Uh, we call them GVF filters. So the GVF filter level one basically evaluates the meter, looks at the pickoff, looks at the frequencies, and then makes small corrections uh, in, in what output you see in the density the mass and the volume. Uh, levels two and three in increase that on different levels of uh, uh, polynomial calculations by taking in information from the driver gains, the absolute driver value, uh, how different one pickoff is from the other and how quickly that difference changes to identify what is actually in the pipe at that particular uh, 10 millisecond time frame. And then it makes corrections for, we know that there's a gas uh, solution in here. Uh, we can evaluate what the standard Coriolis meter will miss because of the situation, and then that value can be added back in. One of the key things here is a feature called decoupling. 
Now, if you can imagine this, this flow stream you see here, as the tube is vibrating, there will be air bubbles that will not be in direct content, co contact with the tube. And the center of, gra center of gravity of the fluid uh, with the air bubble in it will differ from one another. In other words, since the air bubble is so, is so light and the liquid around it is so heavy in comparison, uh, the center of mass changes. I meant to say mass, not gravity. The center of mass changes dramatically or is different from uh, the fluid center of mass than from the gas. And what happens now is that if the bubble isn't in direct contact with the pipe, then you get a significant difference in, in measurement. You're actually stealth. Your bubble is not touching the tube. It's equivalent to uh, passing a, the holiday turkey over the scale and wondering why the scale isn't measuring the turkey. Well, you have to put the turkey on the scale in order to weigh it, where in this case you would need to have the bubble in contact to, with the tube. If the bubble is kind of floating in the middle and has a different center of mass than the fluid, it's not being measured. But what it is doing is it is changing the density. It is changing the pickoffs in the right and the left. It is changing the drive gain. It is changing the frequencies. It is those data points that Siemens uses in our polynomials and our calculations to uh, compensate for gas void. So from 0 to 5% gas mix, you have a good measurement that is repeatable and accurate. From 5 to, say, 10%, you can get a reliable measurement. Uh, the accuracy may not be phenomenal, but the repeatability will be pretty good. And, uh, and, and, and reliable. Now beyond 10%, depending on how far away you stray and the nature of the gas distribution uh, will determine whether or not you have a reliable or a good measurement or overall a, a poor measurement. Interestingly, in uh, field tests, we have found that uh, these values are fairly conservative and when we're distributing uh, up to 15% uh, gas or even more, that it is uh, possible to get uh, a fairly repeatable value uh, out of uh, a Siemens Coriolis meter. Of course, that's with optimal conditions. Uh, it depends on the application. So our intelligent filtering, our aerated liquids, our GVF filter stabilizes the measurement of aerated liquids. It can use to detect how much air is in the liquid. It uh, automatically enacts as soon as the driver current tells it to. Uh, it works on both the mass, the density, as well as the volume, and can get good and repeatable measurements up to five to uh, five to ten percent or more. So that's the uh, forty-two minutes showing. Uh, I didn't want to spend too much time. If there are any questions, I, I do invite you to please ask. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions you have. Eric, thank you very much for your presentation. We're gonna, I'm gonna take over here for a second and give some people some time to ask questions just in case they would like to. Uh, let me just pull this up. Should be seeing my screen now. Uh, if there are any specific application questions, feel free to give me a call if you don't feel like typing it into the question tool here. I can be reached at 800-9-LESSMAN, and you can just ask for me, Mike D. Lecluse. Uh If you do know your account manager, feel free to contact him as well. Uh, my email address, if you need it, is uh, simply mikeD at lessman.com, and you can send any questions to that email address. If you'd like to know more about the technologies we supply, you can follow us on social media. Dan's blog is very active and has tons of great tips on it. All of our webinars are posted both on our website and on our Lessman Instrument Co. YouTube channel. Uh, so if you just go to YouTube and type in Lessman Instrument, uh, it'll all the videos that we have out there will come up. Uh, if you want to know when something new is posted, please follow us on LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, next month, our webinar topic is going to be a continuation of the flow theme, and is going to be presented by Lessman's own Dan Weisey. Uh, Dan's going to talk about some developments that have gone on in multivariable 
uh, transmitters, uh, specifically uh, how measuring differential pressure, static pressure, and temperature can uh, be used to calculate mass flow. Uh, we don't have a date set, but uh, we will have it set shortly, and we'll be sending out an announcement regarding it. Uh, one of the questions that's come up, Eric, is can you talk briefly about natural gas measurements? Yes. Eric? Uh, as soon as I take it off mute, I can, I can surely do that. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. So, so natural gas is, is like any fluid. Uh, there's nothing special about natural gas. Um, as a matter of fact, natural gas isn't even itself special in that you find natural gas in one area is significantly different than natural gas in another. Uh, you could use both of these meters that we talked about to measure natural gas. Uh, they all have mass, they all flow, it doesn't really matter. The FC200 compressed natural gas meter was specifically designed for the compressed natural gas market in that the materials that it's made up are hastaloy, they can handle very high pressures up to 5,000 psi or more, uh, and uh, they, they were designed for that marketplace. That being said, uh, if uh, you wanted a little bit more flexibility, because these devices were designed to be installed in um, distribution channels, so uh, dispensers, for example, at the gas pump, gas dispensers. That's what these were designed for. But if you needed a little bit more flexibility, you wanted multiple outputs, uh, you wanted to uh, do a little bit more flexible operation, you could surely use the FC430, uh, which would be every bit as accurate as the uh, CNG meter, but it would cost more money. Uh, uh, but there is a greater amount of size variation. So typically we, we try to focus on CNG or compressed natural gas with the compressed natural gas device because of cost considerations, unless the customer has a real specific requirement for some of the additional features that the FC430 has that the FC200 does not. Okay, is there any, if you would like to further that question, please do. We've got his contact information so we can reach back out to and make sure that we can close the loop on that discussion. Okay. What else? Uh, I don't have any further questions. Uh, so, if there are any further questions, feel free to email me. E email them to me, and I'll uh, get Eric involved, and we'll make sure that we get them answered. Uh, at this point, we'll we'll conclude the, conclude the presentation. Eric, thank you very much. My pleasure. Uh, very very well done. Thank you, sir. And appreciate it. And uh, everybody out there in the audience, thank you very much for taking the time and attending. Have a great day, everybody. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.